There's still time to do the single most important thing you can do to protect your garden from pests and diseases this season. I'm already starting to get all the questions. Mike, what do you do about this pest or that pest? Look, anything I can tell you to do later on is going to pale in comparison to the most important thing you can do right now, which is to invest in making your garden a healthy, diverse ecosystem. You will be summoning a legion of beneficial soil organisms and insects to come protect your garden from pests and diseases. There is an abundance of research on this, and almost all these studies find what this one did, that this strategy is highly effective. For just one example, this one found that just planting a few flowers reduced aphid populations in potatoes by 75%. And most of these studies, like the potato one, barely do this justice. Because most of these studies still use chemical fertilizers, which are proven in research to dramatically increase pest and disease problems. In my experience backs what I see in the research. If we cut the chemicals and build an ecosystem, we really can bring damage in the garden down to the point where it's barely noticeable. So how do we build that health ecosystem and get the maximum benefit? I want to talk about two studies that show us four main strategies to focus on. This one looked at butterfly populations, and this really excellent study looked at native bee populations. Both of these are great indicators of overall biodiversity. Now, specifically, both of these were comparing the benefits of native versus non-native plants. And this will probably really surprise some people, but the populations of native bees and butterflies in both of these studies was actually higher in the plant mixes that included non-natives. This one in particular compared gardens of only native pollinator plants versus only non-native pollinator plants. And it was honestly more than a bit biased in favor of the native plants, but that's fine because we want people to plant native plants. But they actually found that the non-native plants hosted more species of native bees and more native bees in general. And the butterfly study found the same thing. So we can learn four things from these studies. One, plant some native plants. But it's not enough to just plant native plants. Both sets of study authors concluded that non-native plants could provide important sources of food for native insects. And they concluded that if we care about native insects, we shouldn't go out of our way to, like, rip out all the non-native species. Two, and probably most importantly, include a long season of flowers. Both these studies agreed with previous studies that having flowers all season long was one of the most important factors in having a lot of biodiversity. Three, include flowers of all different colors which is why all these are color-coded. And four, focus on plants that include a huge abundance of flowers and aromatics, like all of these. By the way, this image is in both of my books, uh, Beauty in Abundance and the Beginner's Landscape Transformation Manual. And I got a big sale on the Landscape Transformation Manual right now, so check that out. Okay, so now that we've got the summary out of the way, let's get a little bit nerdier. First, a little bit about the details in the bee study. The researchers found 719 bees in 49 species on the native plants, while well, meanwhile on the non-native plants they found 989 bees in 63 native species. The only non-native bee they found in their study was the honeybee. So all the others on the native and the non-native plants were native species. Which is interesting because sometimes I hear people say that planting non-native plants is only good for non-native insects. And that native insects can't use non-native plants, or at least not very well. But here we see this isn't true. And in the studies, they both also looked at specialist species and found that they were getting specialist species on non-native plants too. So even the specialist species during parts of their life cycle are able to live on non-native plants. So why is it that the authors think that the non-native plants perform better than the native plants in these studies? Because that certainly seems at odds with what uh, a lot of people are telling us about native plants. But really this is just part of the logic of large ecosystems and large economies. Call it ecosystems of scale. It's the same as when people say that native plants are better for drought because they have deep roots. Well, think about that. Why would plants in North America have deeper roots than plants of any other continent on Earth? Especially when other places are more arid than most of North America. You would think that those arid places like the Chinese steppe would have plants that are very drought tolerant compared to, like, Michigan. And the fact is that is true. 
Now, if you choose a bunch of plants native to Michigan and then a bunch of random plants that are just selected for like having big, beautiful flowers and you put them in the garden, then on average, probably the Michigan native plants are going to be more well adapted to the climate of Michigan, right? But if the goal is to create drought resilient gardens, then if we go around the world and can select from all of the plants in the world and find the most drought tolerant plants, then Obviously, that selection of garden plants would be better for drought tolerance than just Michigan native plants. If we're taking plants from the whole world, there are just simply going to be more plants to choose from that have high drought tolerance. And it's very unlikely that Michigan would have produced the most drought tolerant plants for Michigan in the world. And the same exact logic applies here. If we're choosing the best pollinator plants in the whole world and we have all of those plants to choose from, then we're going to get more plants with more colors and that are just better for pollinators than if we're only using plants native to our locality. So again, both sets of study authors concluded that non-native flowers can be an important resource for butterflies and or bees throughout the season and particularly at key times such as in drought at the beginning and the ends of seasons when native flowers are not as abundant. And that this is at odds with current management regimes that typically recommend eradication of non-native plants, which could leave butterflies and other pollinators without sufficient nectar resources. Again, both sets of study authors focused on the four things in this video. Not going out of our way to just re indiscriminately remove all the non-native plants. Two, having a long season of flowers. Three, having a lot of different colors of flowers. And four, uh, having plants that just produce a large abundance of flowers and nectar. Again, it's pretty logical that it would be easier to meet all of those goals if we have a whole bunch of, a larger group of plants to choose from. If we're limiting ourselves to only North American native plants with a smaller set of plants, we're going to have fewer flowers through the season, fewer colors, and plants that don't quite produce as many huge, beautiful flowers. This also implies that we could do a lot better even than what's in both of these studies. When I look at the studies and the species used in these studies, uh, both of them use plants that I would consider low-moderate uh, pollinator plants for the non-natives, and they picked the best of the best pollinator plants from the natives. Again, that's fine. They have a slight bias in these studies towards native plants, which they repeat over and over again. They're pretty honest about it. Which is great. We should all be planting more native plants, right? But this implies that if we really wanted to up those beneficial insect numbers and be better stewards of butterflies and pollinators, then we could specifically choose the best plants that we know of uh, for pollinators for our areas. And we actually have some great research on the best pollinator plants that are non-natives, and a lot of those plants were not included in these studies. But I always make sure to include them in all my resources. And then finally, beyond just our plant choices and providing food for the pollinators, there are things that we can do to increase beneficial insects overall in our gardens that are repeated in the research over and over and over again. Uh, and I've posted those sorts of studies in my channel before. Uh, and some of those things are using a variety of habitats, lots of edge. Hedgerows make hedge in landscapes. And so having diverse hedgerows is one of the single best things that we can do for uh, biodiversity in our gardens. Another one is just simply different kinds of habitats. Having water around, having nurse logs around, having lots of debris on the ground, using mulch, using no-till, and avoiding chemicals. We do all those things and we start to get gardens that can really pop, as Toby Hemingway used to say. And when we get that right, we really do bring the garden pests and disease and weed problems under a lot more control than conventional gardeners could ever believe. Thanks for watching it. If you're still watching this after me going on and on about all this nerdy science stuff, then you like nerdy science and you should definitely subscribe. And like and share with anybody else who you also think is a plant nerd. Thanks.